Hello, everybody. This is me, V, or White Zulu, and welcome to another piece of my autobiography of the same name. Now, please bear with me. I've had endless chest and throat infections, and my voice has been not as good as it should be and quite scratchy. So I may be clearing my... <clears throat> clearing my throat like this through the reading. If it gets too bad, I'll have to cancel it. But hopefully we can get through this without annoying you all too much. This is chapter 13 called Jomela and Up on Top, which is Lyndhurst. In this chapter, I talk about our old herdsman, Jomela, who'd been retired to the valley to help with the garden. I'd also gotten, I also go into the top of the farm above the valley, the escarpment beyond the Intlazan mountain, which is in this enormous far reaching plateau and looks onto the Drakensberg mountain range. This is approximately 3000 acres of mainly marshland or flays and provides excellent grazing for all our stock. Ed edging the lawn took up most of Jamela's time and he kept up a lively animated conversation with himself as he slowly inched his way along the endless sweep of Kikuyu grass with his shears. Now and again, he'd give a loud hyena-like cackle of laughter at one of his own jokes. And we found it quite unnerving if we were lying in a cane easy chair on the front veranda with our legs in the sun, reading and relishing the peace or idly watching purple and golden butterflies sipping from dangling red fuchsia flowers hanging from the big white pots at the veranda's edge. Greater double-coloured sunbirds flocked to sip from scarlet salvia, and the males especially, in their iridescent plumage of emerald heads, and scarlet bodies with a band of bright blue across the breast, hanging tentatively, almost hovering, as their long curled tongues searched down the floral tubes of sweet nectar, for sweet nectar. In the middle of our hottest summer days, all we could do was to retire to the deepest shade of the very back of our front veranda and lie there, bare feet up on the cushioned footstool and read, or gaze into the dense bush on the other side of the river. Our thoughts would be miles away when we'd hear a hissing from just the other side of the flower bed and then a high pitched cackling, which subsided to wheezing chuckles making us jump with fright, only to stand up and, peering over the shrubs, see Jomela's tattered old hat going slowly by. We were fairly accustomed to Jomela, but he could make visitors jump out of their skins, expecting a puff adder when his hissing began. Lindhurst, otherwise known as up on top. Shortly after he moved on to New Forest, Grandpa bought the adjacent ranch Lindhurst, which is on the plateau at the top of the mountain behind our house. Lindhurst is an immense 3,000 acre treeless stretch of grassland and including the four vast main flays which form the sponge of the Mgeni River. It's the breeding habitat of South Africa's only three crane species, 
the rare and highly endangered wattle crane, as well as the blue crane, which is our national bird, and the crowned crane. It's most unusual, if not almost unknown, for all three types of crane to occur in one place in South Africa. Getting to Lyndhurst is a climb of 1,000 feet, and Grandpa had put his engineering skills to use, building a narrow road which zigs up, up the nearly vertical mountainside. He'd used Zulu laborers and oxen, pulling a homemade metal blade to scour out the road which was wide enough to accommodate an ox wagon and a team of 16 oxen. At one bend in the road, which we call Devil's Corner, he'd encountered several massive boulders, rather like the ones we called elephant rocks, as they were the same size, texture and colour. Some of the smaller rocks he managed to split by the simple means of lighting a fire on top of the boulder, getting it as hot as possible, and then getting his Zulu labourers to pour buckets of ice-cold water from the nearby mountain stream over them. The rocks split cleanly through their weakest places, and he repeated the process until the pieces were small enough to be hauled away by his team of oxen. The huge boulders were almost un insurmountable obstructions, but Grandpa, typically undaunted, sent a letter to W.G. Brown and Co., his father-in-law's warehouse in Durban, and ordered some sticks of dynamite to be sent up by rail to Nottingham Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. He duly received these in a presumably carefully packed wooden box, fuses included. He instructed one of his labourers to drill the correct sized hole in each boulder by hand. So this must have been quite some job as the rocks are solid granite. Grandpa placed the sticks of dynamite into the holes, gave his Induna, Robert Ngiti's father, a box of mash matches, and said to them in his fluent Zulu, go and light the bit of string and then balega as fast as you can to the furthest boulder and hide behind it. He already having placed himself well out of reach of any possible flying debris. The technique worked and as far as I know, nobody got hurt and one can see the exact spot on each boulder where the dynamite blasted the rock in half or quarters. It is possible in any weather. As soon as one crests the final rise in the road leading up from the steep valley, all that is visible is rolling felt and flays as far as the eye can see. With the distant range of the Drakensberg Mountains as the backdrop, it's lovely to ride there in the summer months over the long soft grass looking at the heifers grazing the luscious green fodder with their skippity calves at their heaves, heels, and then having a glorious extended gallop along the extra long, closely mown airstrip with its faded, ragged khaki canvas windsock on the corner. Our strip is at the same altitude as Johannesburg Airport's main takeoff runway and even the small planes which use our strip need an extra amount of runway to be able to take off into the thin air at 6,000 feet. 
The airstrip was the bane of Dad's life. The Department of Defense insisted it was kept closely mown and operational and that the windsock was up and flying at all times in case there was any unrest from Impantla. This was during the 40 odd years of living under apartheid and our strip, as well as our new bridge over the Mgeni River, were vital access routes to strategic points overlooking that large African settlement where all our staff came from. Guests and relations who decided to visit us by plane regularly regularly landed on our lovely extra long strip. One early summer afternoon, just as the pale green grass was getting longer, a group of us, mum and dad, some of my sisters, an English cousin in his early 20s who was staying with us and the dogs were enjoying a pleasant stroll along the airstrip. Dad had parked the Land Rover at the very edge of the strip and was doing a routine check for molehills, which would need to be scraped flat before they became tussocks and dangerous to aircraft taking off or landing. He also needed to check for ant bear holes. The art fox would come out at night and dig deep holes in the ground as they searched for the delicious termites to them and the Zulus anyway. Apparently, according to Dumasan, they tasted of nice fatty marrow. Those deep holes also posed a hazard and needed to be filled in by hand with shovels by his laborers. Dad also needed to see when the grass strip next needed cutting by a small team of oxen and the old mower. On this particular idyllic morning, we heard a strange whistling sound high above our heads, but it didn't sound like any bird call we knew, and we all looked up. There was a glider circling gracefully the whistling coming from its wire wing struts. The pilot circled lower as we craned our necks to see who it was, and we hurried off the airstrip, grabbing the dogs and hustling them into the cab of the vehicle. The beautiful aircraft landed as silently as it had flown over, and we hurried over to find Brian Walters a friend of ours, climbing out of, the, out of the cockpit. We all embraced, and Bran, who just qualified and was working as an architect in Durban, told us that he'd flown up from the gliding club's airfield near Midmar Dam. It was such a perfect day, and the thermals were so good that he'd been able to come up to over 6,000 feet and thought he'd drop in on us <clears throat> on the off chance that one or more of the Ross family would be fishing for trout, checking the cattle as it was calving time, or just taking advantage of the beautiful settled weather for a day out on Lyndhurst. Mum invited him to stay but he declined, explaining that the weather forecast was for possible thunderstorms in the Berg area, and he certainly couldn't afford to take any chances of being caught up in one of those in his fragile craft. So he asked us to help him turn his glider around to face the warm, mild breeze which was blowing and started up a tiny engine with a small propeller. Now comes the tricky bit, he said. Since the glider only has two wheels, one at the front and a very small one at the back, 
two people have to hold the wings up off the ground and run like mad so that I'm an, at an even keel for takeoff. I was 14 years old at the time and jumped at the chance to show off and our cousin rather more reluctantly volunteered to hold the other wing. And off we went. Brian had his engine at full throttle, and as the glider gathered speed, we runners had to really pick up the pace and balega to keep up with him. Just as I thought I couldn't manage any more speed, and was racing along barefoot through the grass, Bran gave us this hand signal to let go, and the craft soared away and up into the sky as gracefully and as silently as it had arrived. Bran banked and gave us a thank you wing waggle before he turned the nose towards Midmar and the plane became a tiny white speck in the distance. The real problem with our airstrip was the climate. We live in the mist belt, which means that when it's overcast over the rest of the Natal Midlands, we would be sitting in dense mist, so thick you couldn't see your hand in front of your face which is effectively sitting in the clouds and could go on for five days at a time, meaning that anyone who landed was stuck on the farm with no me means of getting out until the mist cleared, which could be nearly a week. Dad hated having every anyone to stay at the best of times, but sometimes they were complete strangers. People used to pop down onto our strip on a nice day out, looking at the beauty of the Drakensberg Mountains and suddenly find themselves stranded. The mist could come rolling down over the escarpment within the space of half an hour or so. And if we were out walking, riding or driving on the felt, even we, who knew the area so well, knew we had to find a road quickly or we would become totally lost for five or more days. The temperature dropped immediately, the sun was obliterated by the mist and it could get as low as freezing point at night. The upshot was that suddenly Dad would find himself playing host for an indefinite length of time to people he neither knew nor liked. His worst nightmare. He'd sit there glowering resentfully while these people made free with his good whiskey, wine and sherry and mum panicked about provisions running out in the kitchen. Fortunately, we usually had a good supply of food off the farm itself, but there could be a danger of running out of items like tea and coffee or flour and sugar, the supplies which she would have to order from Hoosens. Up on top, as we always called Lindhurst, had more distinctive seasons than we had in the valley. It was a very, it is a very bleak place in winter, as with the autumn frosts, the green felt turns a pale tawny yellow, exactly the colour of a lion. There is not a speck of green anywhere, and a bitterly cold wind knifes down from the berg, bringing with it snow blizzards every winter. Through meticulous meteorological records, kept every day, first by Grandpa and then by Dad, it has been recorded that snow falls up on top during the, every month of the year for the last 
135 years, and frost has also been recorded every month of that season since records began in 1888. Even on most Christmas Eves, which is our midsummer, we'd all sit around a roaring log fire, knowing that it could be snowing up on top or a thick layer of frost was settling up there. In the valley, too, there was frost all through the winter, and snow every winter, but it usually melted away by mid-morning, and we could run around in shorts and t-shirts and bare feet until sundown, when the frost began to settle again. Lyndhurst offered excellent and almost all year round grazing and water, and it was there, and it was where Dad ran his thousand head of cattle and five thousand head of sheep. These were overseen by a couple of Zulu herdsmen on horseback who supervised the carving and kept an eye out for jackal problems. Grandpa had been determined to grow mealies as winter feed for his stock somewhere on the farm during the summer instead of having to buy it. Anywhere in the valley was hopeless for, as soon as the little green shoots broke through the ground, they would have been nibbled away by baboons and vervet monkeys who would strip away every mealy cob if it survived the buck and bush pig, who, which loved to root through ploughed fields, crunching up the juicy mealy stalks. So, unless the fields were protected by an electric fence, growing any form of crops was a non-starter. But up there on the plateau of Lindhurst, there were no trees and very few really big boulders or crags and hence no baboons, bush pigs or monkeys, all of which need both for cover and habitat. Here lives another variety of small antelope species, sparsely scattered and in too small numbers to do much damage to a young mealy crop. These are the very rare red hearty beast living in a solitary state and very well hidden. These are only found in Southern Africa. No more than 130,000 individuals were left when I wrote this book many years ago. Males and females look alike and they only pair up to mate before separating again. Hearty beasts have an excellent sense of hearing and smell, although their sight is poor. When alarmed, hearty beasts elude confusion before running, by which they can reach a maximum speed of 50 miles kilometers an, 55 kilometers an hour. The evasion tactic is to run in a zigzag pattern making them difficult for predators to catch. Other resident back on top are the Oribe antelope, known as South Africa's tiny bouncing antelope, which roam on the several thousand acres of felt up there. A very rare species, the population is at best scattered and sparse in Southern Africa. There are about four rams distinguished by their short straight horns ridged at the base. Each has their two ewes and they live up in the hills right at the very top corner flay of Lindhurst. They are almost impossible to see unless one of the dogs puts them up to scatter and bolt from their hiding places in the long grass. One would be entertained by watching them display their distinctive storting action when alarmed or excited. 
which entails vertical forward, le forward le leaning leaps with straight legs. Early Boer settlers named this bouncing action pronking. They have comical oval shaped ears, a long slender neck and thin slim legs. Their tiny tails are black and there are white accents around their snouts. The coat of an Oribe is tinted from brownish to yellow hues, which allows the animal to hide better from the many infamous African predators in the region, in the region especially jackals. Occasionally we'd see gigantic eland and in fact, I must tell you this, that my sons were there last April and they filmed 1,000 eland grazing on the top of our farm, which is a lot of eland together. They're normally solitary. These are antelope, antelope the same size as full-grown cattle and are specific browsers of the Nchichi bush which grows in profusion in the gullies up there. Not nearly so obvious, but also extremely rare is the golden mole, which lives up there. It's distinct from true moles, but they bear a re remarkable resemblance to the marsupial moles of Australia. Their giveaway is that they make shallow raised tunnels that hump out of the surface of the soil rather than the deep downward bur burrows of true moles. So Grandpa, in his usual indomitable way, drained the marshland by digging, sorry, using most of his labour, a team of 16 oxen and a homemade ditch digger for a scoop. He created furrows all around the flay, which drained the water off into the stream, which becomes the Mgeni River, or one of the flays, and then ploughed up the entire now dried out flay of around 200 acres. These days, this would be seen as ecological vandalism. But at that time, it was a case of a settler making his land arable. Grandpa's mealy crops were so successful that he built a mill in the valley so as to be able to grind the, the kernels to make mealy meal flour for our bread and lovely coarse yellow porridge, which we ate for breakfast slathered in rich cream. The mealy meal supplemented our staff rations too, and our pigs, ducks and fowls feasted on the remains. Even the stable cats and our farm dogs had a huge enamel washing up bowl, brimming with homegrown uputu and skimmed milk put outside for, the, for them every morning by Mackay. Everyone had, <clears throat> everyone had to share that bowl. And Mups, our rather dim-witted golden cocker spaniel, resented the fact that he had to share his food with the Muscovy ducks, which had free roam of the garden. He'd spend most of the morning lying in wait for the leader, a huge drake called Patrick, who would come waddling along to the Uputu bowl with all his wives in tow. Once Patrick had dipped his beak into the dish, Mups would charge him and then run back yelping to his cover with Patrick attached tightly by his beak to Mups's long floppy ear. This drama went on every morning, even though there was plenty of food to go around. It was just a principle Mup, Mups wasn't prepared to abandon. In May, up on top, when the shadows grow longer 
and there are the first signs of frost. Red, white and pink everlasting flowers appear in profusion and we pick them by the armful, bringing them down to the house to be stuffed into any dry receptacle where they give off the sweet dry scent of freshly cut hay and last for years. The leaves of the, of the Malochazan bush turn russet red and come into fruit, a wild raspberry with berries far more delicious and sweeter than any garden raspberry. And up there, there are no baboons to strip them. Mum asked the farm girls to fill their enamel bowls with this fruit and they would arrive at the kitchen for Masangu to make jars and jars of Malochazan jam for us to eat on our buttery toast all year round. At that time of the year, Dad would take his pointers up and train them to find red-legged Franklin, Natal Franklin, partridges, quail, and even guinea fowl which had strayed over from the Rolls farm next door, mealy fields. All these types of game bird he shot and brought home for Masangu to roast or casserole with apple jelly, bacon and red wine. We called them nyornies and they were delicious beyond words. Running fire breaks. Once the grass had turned tawny brown and dried off, Dad would get his winter fire breaks burnt. This was to protect his pine plantations and good winter grazing from being burnt off by runaway bushfires, of which there were plenty every year. Once the end of July passed and the dry season supposedly reached its end, Dad finished off his burning by setting controlled fires on windless days, carefully allowing the grass to burn slowly and keeping control of the situation. We children loved the burning season and were allowed to set the line where he wanted the fire break burnt by walking along with a small tin of paraffin with a handle in one hand and in the other a straight length of baling wire bent around a mealy cob on one end. We dipped the cod cob into the paraffin and then put it into the previous patch of burning grass and walked along in the designated straight line dotting flames into the dry felt as we walked. Now and again, we'd have to dunk our corn cob back in the paraffin and then back into the last fire. Sometimes we'd get it wrong and dunk a flaming cob into the paraffin, but there was always an adult, usually in Geeti, nearby to put out the fire in the pot by smothering it with a wet sack. Behind the fire setter walked a team of Zulu men and women, each carrying a wet sack stitched to a wattle pole like a flag, and their job was to put out the fire once a sufficiently wide strip of grass had been burnt. Things got tricky for me once, at the age of about six, when... As fire setter, I had to climb through a barbed wire fence with my paraffin tin and cob stick. I didn't have the brains to put everything down, carefully dousing the flaming cob <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> before I tackled the fence, which was standing in the long grass where the cattle had, hadn't been able to reach through to graze it down. The next thing I knew, I was tangled up in the barbed wire and all the felt around me was six feet high in roaring flames. 
I could see no escape, so I screamed for help, and it was Ngiti who came stamping through the fire in his gumboots to lift me carefully out of the barbs and then set me down on a rock safely away from the fire while he went back to retrieve the pot and my mealy cob on its wire. In August, the fire breaks all turned green and Dad turned the stock onto them for some early fresh grazing after their four months diet of hay and commercial feed, supplemented by browsing in the bush and a bit of silage. Once the blackened felt had turned to green, usually within a few weeks of the soft rains, the wild flowers began to bloom and up on top the entire felt was a painter's palette of different colours. There, well, it still is. I don't know why I'm saying this in the past. It's all still there. There are the pale pink gladiola-like diorama everywhere, interspersed with scarlet amaryllis, yellow flowers, blue flowers, felt flame lilies, white and gold arums in the flays, and snowy St. Joseph's lilies on the banks. Near the streams were red mombretia and blue agapanthus. Dine and I could walk for 20 yards along the gently sloping bank, which led into a flay, and pick anything up to 30 different wildflowers in that short distance. We always had to stop long before we'd completed a complexion, as we couldn't hold the bunches in our hands. There were so many different colours and varieties. And that included the teeniest granny bonnets, as we called them. So we'd sit down in the grass and make ourselves coronets out of the sweetly scented strands of wild peppermint herb, which grew in long, pretty strands with tiny pale green leaves. And we always knew where to find them because as we walked along barefoot, as usual through the soft grass, the strong peppermint silt scent would waft up from our toes and we'd stop and collect some to tie up our bundles of multicolored flowers. And the rest were twisted into sweet minty crowns for our heads. We felt like princesses walking sedately along with our heads adorned and carrying our armfuls of posies like bridesmaids. That's enough for this time. I want to thank John Moslane very much for doing this for me. Without him, I couldn't put out these videos. And I have an enormous amount of gratitude to him for that. I also want to thank you very much for listening. And I hope you're enjoying the picture I'm painting of this exquisite part of a secret paradise, which all still exists. If I change tenses, I don't know why, it's all still there. And if you'd like to go and see more pictures, I have a website at www.whitezulubook.com. So this is thank you from me and goodbye. <laughs>